हेलो वेलकम टू द ईपीजी पाठशाला प्रोग्राम इन लिंग्विस्टिक्स आई एम प्रोफेसर रविंद्र गार्गेश फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ लिंग्विस्टिक्स यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली टुडे वी विल डिस्कस लिंग्विस्टिक स्टाइलिस्टिक्स इन दिस नाइन्थ मॉड्यूल एज पार्ट ऑफ लिंग्विस्टिक स्टाइलिस्टिक्स वी विल बी फोकसिंग ऑन मेटाफर मेटाफर हैज़ अ स्पेशल प्लेस इन फिगरेटिव लैंग्वेज वी विल डिफाइन द मेटाफर we will see the context of metaphor we will also look at the metaphorical process as well as how to interpret a metaphor so this module will make you aware of the importance of the metaphor its importance in literature as well as in ordinary speech at the end of the module you should be able to appreciate how metaphor plays a seminal role in both ordinary speech and literary discourse this module follows the earlier module on figurative language metaphor is a greek term meaning carrying over as we have already learned a figure of speech which describes one thing as being another it is characterized by semantic deviation human communication system allows language users to assign new meanings to words metaphor exploits characteristics of language to create word pictures or images that convey the poet or the ordinary user's perception of the world around them if public speakers have exploited metaphor for rhetorical effect poets have done so for aesthetic effect in fact we keep using old and new metaphors all the time the philosophers of science religious preachers and of course politicians they use them and people find it difficult to grasp new concepts unless they are expressed by a concrete model we are often not aware of the of the metaphorical nature of many expressions in common use so we will have a look at some of these examples also which are called dead metaphors we don't recognize the metaphors in our everyday life but there are so many metaphors in our everyday life and their use reveals the deeply metaphorical nature of language conceptual metaphor theory rejects the notion that metaphor is a decorative device that it is peripheral to language and thought no it is not instead the theory holds that metaphor is central to thought and therefore to language reference to lekoff lekoff and johnson the metaphors will buy now to define a metaphor what is a metaphor in western poetics Among the earliest definitions we get of metaphor is of is given by Aristotle. Metaphor consists in giving the thing a name that belongs to something else. The transference being either from genus to species or from species to genus or from species to species or from genus to genus on grounds of analogy. so grounds of analogy are very important with analogy we the the metaphor is the metaphor functions this definition subsumes metonymy and synecdoche also as well but there are three implications of aristotle's definition one metaphor is a word figure two it is a figure of resemblance three it involves a deviation from everyday usage Of course this definition subsumes metonymy and synecdoche with the property of transfer of meaning being common to all the three figures most of the modern definitions of metaphor focus essentially on resemblance or similarity and often club it with simile where a simile compares two items a metaphor directly equates them and does not use like or as as it is done in the simile metaphor is thus a reduced to a figure of implied comparison as against simile which has explicit comparison and we will see that metaphor involves similarity but involves much more as well the linguist interest in metaphor lies in its being as can be seen on the module in figurative language that it is characterized by semantic deviation it involves a special type of language use which cannot be explained within the domain of standard grammar of language take for example he drowned in a sea of grief 
the statement consists of two metaphors. But let's consider the second metaphor, a sea of grief. It is a metaphor because grief is not sea water literally. The metaphor sets up an equivalence between the two objects from two different semantic domains. Sea water, a concrete object and grief, an abstract concept through what Roger Fowler calls the cooperative fusion. It is a cooperative fusion that is in describing one thing as being another. It fuses two different things or ideas to create a new word picture. The reader visualizes grief as a vast, deep and restless body of water in which you can only drown. So, a modern linguist Sapir, he also defines the metaphor simply as a trope that states an equivalence between terms taken from different semantic domains. We can enlarge the definition and say a metaphor is a figure of speech which describes one thing as being another. But the two things must belong to two different semantic domains. Even though we have talked about one thing being described as another, metaphor is not confined to nouns only. Other parts of speech can also be used metaphorically. For example, in William Wordsworth's poem Tintin Abbey, he uses the verb clad metaphorically to describe the green top of the orchards. These orchard tufts are clad in one green hue. So clad is a verb, but then it is metaphorical, represents the color of the orchard. Look at some more lines by Robert Frost, where nouns, verbs and adverbs have been used in a metaphorical way. Example, leaves got up in a coil and hissed, blindly stuck at my knee and missed. Here, this is the poem is titled Bereft by Robert Frost. The poet uses an extended metaphor. An extended metaphor is a chain of metaphor centering around one central idea or object. So this extended metaphor creates a picture of leaves swirling up, that is getting up in a coil and making soft noise, hissing noise like a snake and striking blindly against the poet's knee. So adjectives can similarly be used metaphorically in expressions such as hard cash, soft music, vibrant colors, blind followers, etc. They may be termed dead metaphors. Though dead metaphors today, many of them still remain traces of their figurativeness. Let us look at context and the metaphor. The recognition of metaphor poses a problem because its chief characteristic, semantic deviation, identifies other tropes as well. And second, this semantic deviation is not always manifested in, in linguistic deviation. Let us take an example. All the world's a stage. There are several ways in which it has been suggested it can be, this can be identified as a metaphor. One, it shows semantic deviation and is therefore ungrammatical. But as we noted earlier, in another in the earlier module, this is true of many other tropes. Second, the statement is logically absurd and meaningless on the literal level, and therefore its meaning has to be sought at the figurative level. And again, this is true for many tropes as well. Third, the reader's textual concept departs from known facts about the real world. When a reader comes across a statement like this, they must relate it to what they know of the real world, the world and stage. So these are disjunct categories. Both linguistic and logical approaches fail when a statement happens to make sense both metaphorically and literally. Another example, poets have eyes to see the reality of the world about them. It is the banality of the literal statement which is otherwise perfectly grammatical and has no disjunct categories. 
which compels us to look for an alternative interpretation, we then seek to assign a figurative meaning to eyes. Poets have eyes to see the reality of the world about them. So this goes more than the eyes. This is especially true of a poetic metaphor, which transforms. This is especially true of a poetic metaphor, which transforms into a symbol or an allegory as the poem progresses. And on a day we meet to walk the line, and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. So a poem focusing on the wall. Title: Mending Wall by Robert Frost. It is a literal wall and a metaphorical wall between the two neighbors that signifies absence of trust between neighbors. It is obvious that we have two kinds of metaphors: those that can be identified solely from linguistic deviation, and those in which context leads us to semantic deviation and figurativeness. Whether a semantic, whether a statement is to be taken literally or metaphorically, very often depends. On our recognition of the speaker's intention, as Sir John Searle has pointed out, Disraeli could have said metaphorically, "I have climbed to the top of the greasy pole." Of course, in reference to his political career. Even if he had, in fact, climbed the top of the greasy pole, still it's metaphorical. Here it is metaphorical. Nevertheless, this expression will be a metaphorical statement. Only if political career is not a greasy pole. So we now come to the next. Uh, let's look at the metaphorical process. What is the process that of, uh, by which a metaphor comes around? Metaphorical process involves four factors. One, equivalence. A metaphor sets up equivalence between two verbal signs, irrespective of grammatical structure of a metaphorical expression. For example. She is all states, and all princes I. The equivalence between she and states, or between I and princes, is explicit, but may not always be so. For example, the vibrant colors of the rainbow lit up the sky. The vibrant colors of the rainbow lit up the sky. The equivalence between the verbal signs. Striking colors of the rainbow and vibrant notes of a symphony—two different facts. Five vibrant notes of a symphony is implied, but not stated in the poetic metaphor. In particular, the sign representing either tenor or the vehicle has generally to be reconstructed by the reader. For example, we have already taken the part of this example earlier. We just take a small part. Leaves got up in a coil and hissed. Hateful thoughts enwrap my soul. So these are based on equivalence. The second second factor is similarity. The relationship of equivalence in a metaphorical statement asks us to search for resemblances based on two things. Equal. Two are similarity. The second factor is the relationship of equivalence in a metaphorical statement. It asks us to search for resemblance between two things that are referentially different. Equivalence, as we have noted earlier, is not common identity. The requirement that the two terms in a metaphor belong to different semantic domains presupposes certain differences or dissimilarity in the features of the two objects that have been brought together in a relationship of equivalence in the metaphor. It has to be understood that similarity is the ground of metaphorical equivalence, and it becomes noticeable only by the co-presence of dissimilarity and similarity between the two objects. We must remember, metaphor is a linguistic device for creating a fictive world, and this act of imagination is facilitated if, in the real world, X is like Y in some respects. Now, this similarity can be antecedent similarity or induced similarity. Similarity in metaphor works in two ways. First, antecedent similarity, 
that is similarity which is pre-existing and apparent induced similarity on the other hand is generated by transfer of the features of one sign to another sign that is inducement he burned with jealousy the antecedent similarity between burning and feeling of jealousy consists in mental and physical pain but it also induces the additional meaning of self destruction in the feeling of jealousy by transfer of plus destruction from burning to jealousy induced similarity is thus the very basis of the creative power of metaphor the third factor is interaction the third element of metaphoric process interaction is very important richards in philosophy of rhetoric conceived of interaction between two parts of a metaphor in terms of two thoughts active together he designates them as tenor and vehicle tenor is the subject of the metaphoric combination while vehicle is the metaphorical word that is carrying over its meaning in other words tenor is the object pointed to and vehicle the term or terms in which the tenor is alluded to thus in an example like life is a walking shadow life is the tenor and walking shadow the vehicle which trans transfer some some of its features to life the transfer of features minus substantial minus volitional from shadow to life makes it paradoxical a lifeless object there is a certain bidirectionality produced by this interaction if life assumes some of the character of a walking shadow the walking shadow also has some life infused into it from the interaction with life interaction and paradigmatic choice is another thing we can look at look at the statement a flood of protests poured in following the announcement a large quantity is the literal substitute of a flood now similarity involves a paradigmatic choice that is selection from a set of alternatives called a substitution set theoretically it should be possible to have a substitution set of infinite number of items from which the speaker can make the choice of course metaphysical poets have sought equivalence in some of their bold conceits between objects without a hint of a resemblance between them substitution sets could be flood spate torrent deluge but can the set contain pile crowd host perhaps not because flood spate torrent deluge of protests can pour in but pile crowd host of ton cannot pour in what it means is that the speakers or poets they have to be creative enough to construct a context within which similarity can be set up between tenor and vehicle the two parts of a meta metaphor tenor and vehicle in fact as we shall see later the fewer similarities that are between the two signs the more novel or creative the metaphor is the fourth factor in the metaphor is attention in literature the new critics use the term to mean simultaneous existence of two meanings in a work work of art the theory of metaphor borrows this term to mean the simultaneous existence of literal and figurative meaning in metaphor and as amson has noted in his study of ambiguity this tension is inherent in metaphor as in case of poetic meaning in general metaphorical meaning arises from a harmoniousness of the opposites through the process of of course it is through the process of interaction this interaction seeks to reduce the distance between tenor and vehicle without really eliminating either of them the resulting tension gives the metaphor its figurative meaning again we come back to the old example all the world's a stage the metaphor here is realized by a balance between similarities and dissimilarities between world that is the tenor and stage that is the vehicle the features associated with the world are plus minus abstract plus indeterminate space minus scripted life plus indeterminate time span and what about stage stage has the features plus concrete plus defined space plus scripted role playing plus specified duration 
these dissimilarities are counterbalanced by similarities on the quantitative level. The world is a vast place for living beings to live their life. The world is a vast place for living beings to live in their life, just as the stage is the place of action for a place character for a specified time. The metaphor lies in the tension between the world. The metaphor lies in the tension between the world is not a stage and the world is a stage. So the metaphor lies in these two. So we come to now next the interpreting interpreting of the metaphor. Leach builds up an elaborate model for the interpretation of metaphor with the tenor and vehicle relationship framework provided by Richards in 1936. According to this framework, the analysis of a metaphor follows. Number one, separate the literal from the figurative levels. Two, construct the tenor and the vehicle. This analysis involves number one, separating the literal and the figurative levels. Number two, constructing tenor and vehicle. Three, identifying the sign and interpreta in terms of ground of metaphor. Four, interpretation. The basic premise is that literal and figurative meaning are two ends of the same scale, but the literal is basic and the figurative is derived. We can apply this model to a line from T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. The line is, the yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. Now, first thing is, separate the literal from the figurative. Literal is, the yellow fog that something to the window panes. And the figurative aspect is, rubbing its back upon the window panes. So, rubbing the yellow fog is the literal and whatever that is, rubbing its back on the window panes is the figurative part. Now, these two have to be transformed into tenor and vehicle by postulating relevant semantic elements. The yellow fog in the tenor is minus animate plus soft plus diffuse. Whereas in the vehicle, whatever rubs its back is plus animate and is plus furry, it is plus soft. So the tenor has different uh, semantic features and the vehicle has different semantic features. And the ground of metaphor is stated, we look for similarity between tenor and vehicle. What is the similarity? It is Now the similarity is largely a matter of personal intuition. Every person can look at the similarity in different way. Of course, it will not go beyond the realm of logic. There is striking similarity between yellow fog and the animal that rubs its back upon the window panes. By transfer of features, the yellow fog becomes animate plus soft, but it does not lose its feature plus diffuse. It remains fog, but then it takes the features of animacy and softness. What emerges is the image of fog as a metaphorical object with a living spirit, friendly, warm, softly rubbing against the window panes. We instinctively recognize in it the image of a cat. The images of the fog softly moving across the window panes and of the cat rubbing its back on the window panes, this registers in our mind, they register in our mind simultaneously. Number four, the interpretation. Proofrock is a dramatic monologue of a modern urban individual suffering from a sense of isolation and indecisiveness. On the other side of the window panes, it is a room full of fashionable women talking of Michelangelo. The fog cat is unable to enter, enter it and lingers pathetically on the outside of the house, reflecting the mental paralysis of the poet or the poem I. A proof rock, who is avoiding yet desiring physical contact much by stage four interpretation. Proof rock is a dramatic monologue of a modern urban individual suffering from a sense of isolation and indecisiveness. On the other side of the window panes, it is a room full of fashionable women talking of Michelangelo. The fog cat is unable to enter it and lingers pathetically on the outside of the house, reflecting the mental paralysis of Proofrock himself, who is avoiding, yet desiring, physical contact much more in the same way, 
regardless of what one takes from these images, the build, bewildering collage points to another technique of Eliot and all the modest poets called fragmentation. To summarize, you have been exposed to the following. One, definition of the metaphor in classical and linguistic sense. Second, context of the metaphor in reference to semantic deviation. The metaphorical process in relation to equivalence, similarity, interaction and tension. And the interpretation of metaphor that is in terms of literal and figurative by separating literal and figurative by transforming it into tenor and vehicle by identifying the sign and its interpreter in terms of the ground of metaphor what is the similarity between the two and then finally we have the interpretation.